it's becoming a kind of regular thing. Uh, see, I don't, I don't live in Australia. I grew up here, and uh, Adam and I have a kind of deal. So, and, and maybe next year, because uh, Discovery Channel, I, I just got an email last night. I'm trying to sell the TV production team company who make documentaries for Discovery Channel. Uh, when, when I was there on the, being filmed for the documentary on the singularity, I, I tried to pitch, you know that term, you know, the Hollywood people, to pitch an idea for a movie or whatever. So I was trying to pitch the concept of how about doing a documentary on um, the global state? Uh, because all this technology, I mean, the internet speed's doubling every year. Uh, I call it BRAD, bit rate annual doubling. Right? The internet speed's doubling every year, not every 18 months, every 12 months. And that's going to have a huge impact on, on everything because um, there's no limit to the size of the substrate that you put information on. Right? You go, you, I mean, maybe you could go right down to strings and put information on strings. You have a kind of plank tech. Yeah. I'll, I'll talk a bit about that. So uh, it's likely that this, this phenomenon, this uh, doubling of the internet speed, will just keep going for decades. So try to imagine, uh, so if it's doubling every year with Brad, and you go 30 years into the future, that's 2 to the power 30. That's a billion. And 40 years, it's 2 to the power 40. That's a trillion. So, so ask yourself, what, what could you do with an internet that was like a trillion times faster than today's? And, uh, well, lots of things, but uh, one, one obvious one is that you could um, send utterly vivid three-dimensional images that were as real as, as, as I see you right now, right? And everyone could get everything. There would be no more governmental, monocultured, monogovernmental brainwashing. And, and I'm hyper-conscious of that, because I live in China. Right? And the Chinese are just, they're just, the government is brainwashing them. Like, like the, at the Nuremberg trials at the end of the Second World War, uh, the American judges were asking some of these Nazi generals, how on earth did you persuade the German people to go to war? I said, well, it was easy. <laughs> they had the monopoly from the, <laughs> from the media. They just, just, you know, just brainwashed the public. And that's what the Chinese government is doing. And, and every government does it, in a sense. So um, with, with this incredibly powerful uh, medium, uh, everyone could get everything. Every person could get the whole world media. And then you get a kind of snowball effect where the proportion of people who can speak English, which is already the world chosen world language, it's, it's by far the most spoken second language in the world. Mandarin is the most spoken first. But as a second language, English by a mile. So you can imagine a kind of snowball effect, saturation effect occurring where little kids, they're, they're, they have their world media, I, I, I just call it glow media, right? You know, global media that this, this uh, fantastic internet would allow. And they're looking at all these languages and all these channels from all over the world and zap, 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 zap. And they notice, hmm, 60% of them are in English. Oh, I better learn English, right? And so millions of kids do that. And then imagine you're now the Minister of Technology, Minister of Telecommunications or something, and you have to decide that you will send up your country's uh, national programs, of course in your own language, for, for your own citizens who are all over the world, and you've got enough budget to do several other languages as well, so what will you choose? Well, of course you'll also send up English, because you want to transmit your culture's propaganda, if you like, to, to the world. And so after 10 years, the, the little kids zapping their world media notice that 70% of the stuff is in English. So uh, very likely you will get then a, a global language. And imagine what impact that will have. And then communication of ideas will just transmit so much faster. And then a consequence of that, you will get increasingly, I see, a kind of cultural global jet lag. Homogenization. Cultural homogenization. We're getting more and more the same. Like, like I see the young, like I was in Tokyo, you know, just as a stopover. And you know, I haven't been to Japan for about a decade. And I was struck how tall and big and hefty and muscly the 20-year-old the Japanese are. They're like Americans. They're beefy. 
because right? they're reading the same stuff. And, you know, and I just sort of listening to them and their mentality. They're so different from, from the older generation. So I lived a dec lived eight years in Japan in the 90s. So uh, I, I, just, I just see with my own eyes that you know, we're getting more and more the same, culturally homogenized. And that's a sort of a wonderful thing in some ways because it means it makes it more likely that we could have a world state. Right? That's, that's one of my grand political ambitions to, to see that happen because I, I see the because I've lived in seven countries. Right? I'm not a nationalist. I've utterly outgrown that. So, but I see the damage that, that, that nationalism does because it sort of blinds you. You, you, you know, governments can indict. Like, I grew up in Australia. When I was 20, guess what happened? I'm 60, almost 64 now. What happened to me when I was 20? You know, go back for the older ones. Yeah, I got conscripted to go to Vietnam. Man, did that radicalise me. I mean, that, that whole generation of students just, just got radicalised like crazy. You're going to treat me like a piece of meat? You're going to risk my life to defend your ideology? Well, <laughs> you know, really angry. So, anyway... Cultural homogenization, the increasing likelihood of uh, a global state being created. Today, we live in a... In a na nationalism, in a sense, in some ways is dying, especially politically, economically. Uh, there are now economic blocks. Maybe you heard in the news just a day or two ago. What is it? The next... Is it Croatia? The next country in Europe to join the European Union? Already 27 countries. So soon it'll be 28 in a year or so. And there's a, there's a backlog, and there's a, you know, Turkey and various others want to join. So it'll be up to about 35. Uh, Sarkozy, French president, is talking about uh, bringing in the Arabs, the North Africans, into a, a, a Mediterranean Union. Uh, Merkel, the German female chancellor of Germany, is trying to persuade the Americans to join forces in an Atlantic Union. So EU and NAFTA, North American Free Trade Area. Right? Why? To compete with the giants of China and India this, this century. So even the political blocks are blocking. Like recently in South America, there were two major economic political blocks. They merged into the South American Union, modelled on the EU. They will have their own currency, parliament, blah, blah, blah. Right? So even today, all these sort of political forces pushing towards the creation of global state Where's, where's Adam? So maybe, <laughs> just maybe next summer, a year from now, uh, if you're interested, <laughs> so there's a possibility that the Discovery Channel will, will take this up and, and do another documentation on, on this uh, area. It's the political consequences of accelerating tech. Right? It's not talked about much. We're so locked into our national mentalities and ways of thinking and national cultures and so on. But I consider myself a multi and uh, you know, try to take a more, more global view. Okay, that was just for fun. <laughs> Femtotech. Uh,